each message in this series, and each message obviously had a sermon title, has come directly from the text. And so today, our title comes directly from Malachi 4, verse 2. And it's that phrase that says, but for you who fear my name, for you who fear my name. Now, what is that statement really? When the Lord says, but for you who fear my name, then another call for his people to return. It's just another invitation of the Lord saying again, but for you who fear my name, and as it kind of falls off his lips there, if you listen to it, right, but for you who fear my name, it's almost like an invitation, isn't it? And really, it is an invitation, but for you who fear my name, yes, yes, Lord, what are you about to say? You're kind of like, tell me who and, and what is for those who fear your name, uh, that statement, it, it, it comes with a contrast. Notice in chapter 4, verse 2, a but, a but for you. So there's a contrast there, and that grabs the attention. There are those who do not fear the name, but now there's those who do fear the name. So it grabs attention. It heightens expectancy, but for you who fear my name, yes, yes, yes. It, it brings urgency right away again. But for you who fear my name, so tell me, Lord, tell me, what is it, who is it, how is it for those who fear your name? Well, let's answer that question by allowing that phrase to become the hub of our text. Uh, but for you who fear my name will become the anchor, if you will. It's the anchor that everything else is going to be tied to. And what we will see from the end of chapter 3 as we approach chapter 4, three truths that relate to, but for you who fear my name. What do we learn about those who fear the name of the Lord as we approach the end of the book of Malachi? I realized I have I prayed for Ruth and for the church, but I, just, I really want to take a moment to pray for our time right now. I just feel so, it's been one of, one of those weeks, you know, one of those weeks where you're like, well, every week's like this in some ways, but it was, it was a little different just saying, God, there's been so many distractions this week. It's just been one of those weeks you just never can per, prepare for, and all that to say, let's pray. Father, I just ask right now, that you will use this time. I pray, O oh Lord Jesus Christ, would you help your servant so weak, so unable, um, so without wisdom apart from you and all of us right now, Lord, maybe uh, tired, just been busy, running around here, fearful, whatever it is. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, bless your word. You wrote this book. Now take it and, and allow us to see. Lord, I ask even today, you will save people for the first time ever in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, you will cause people's eyes to see salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ today. Lord, would you do that? Why? That's when you get glory. This is when every life that is transformed from you, you get glory. So be glorified today through your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen? amen? Amen. Okay, so three truths that relate to the fearing of the name of the Lord. We're gonna start with a negative, and then we'll get much more positive. Then a little bit negative, and then it will end with positive. All right? All right? So let's start here. Point number one, when it comes to those who fear the name of the Lord, we see first a lack of fear, a lack of the fear of the Lord, which results in calloused hearts and complaining hearts. Okay? Where there's a lack of the fear of the Lord, there's a hard heart, a calloused heart, and complaining heart. So look at chapter 3, verse 13. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord, to his people. But you say, the people say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of keeping his charge or walking as in mourning? Being, uh, in other words, being sorry for our sins before the Lord of hosts. And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. In some ways, these verses, in verses 13 to 15, summarize again the heart problem of God's people since this book began. In many ways, it's recounting again the very issue from the very beginning as to why this book has been written in the first place, okay? But more specifically, check that. It's the heart problem, really, of God's people all throughout the Old Testament, it's just this pattern of God calling, drawing near the people, but then they grow callous in the heart. They start to complain, and they fall away from the Lord again. God calls them back, and they're there for a little bit, a couple of good leaders, but then the sinful tendencies take over, and they reject the Lord. They complain to the Lord. They accuse God of things, and they fall away again from his love and protection. Now, we look at Malachi's day. We're like, why? what's wrong with the people? We look at the Old Testament. We go, man, what's wrong with the people? But the wise person right now looks at my own heart and says, What's wrong with me? 
And am I like that? Is my heart hard? Is my heart callous? Do I have a heart problem right now too? Notice in verse 13 that Israel had been speaking against God in a hard way, it says. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. Imagine God, like this is God saying, man, you've been, you've been harsh to me. You've been speaking against me in a sinful, in a hard way. Notice there's no gratitude from God's people. There's the opposite. There's a complaining. There's a, an, an anger, a frustration. There's a protest against God. Just as their ancestors did before them, their hearts so quickly moved to complaint versus gratitude or contentment. Okay, time out, time out. How would you describe yourself? Would you be more of a complainer or someone who's tending towards contentment? I mean, how many of us would answer honestly to that? Maybe ask your spouse that question about yourself, eh? There's a, or ask a really good friend and just say, am I prone to complain and feel dissatisfied in the Lord, or am I moving more and more towards a sense of contentment? Because this becomes a problem to the Lord here, because look at verse 13. The people, they dispute again, and they say, how have we spoken against you, God? What are you talking about? God, what do you mean we've spoken against you? We don't think we've spoken against you. Again, it's like, it's like a rebuttal. It's, a, it's an arguing. There's a dispute here. Now, right here in that phrase, how have we spoken against you, right there is the seventh time in Malachi that the people dispute with God, okay? What I want to do right now, I want to recap. This is a great way to summarize the book of Malachi. It's a great way to give an outline of what's happening as well, okay? So seven times the people dispute. We've been through all seven now, including today. This is what, and hard hearts are revealed here, okay? This is how they dispute. They argue back with God. How have you loved us, God? Show us your love. How dare they say that? That was message number one. How have we despised you? God says you've despised me. How? How? And it's not like, can we honestly ask how have we despised you? It's like, it's like the complaint back. Oh, yeah? How have we despised you? How have we polluted you? How have we wearied the Lord? How shall we return, God? Last week, how have we robbed you, God? And then today, how have we spoken against you, God? This is all the argumentation of God's people against the holy, righteous, and awesome God. Again, this is the book of Malachi in a nutshell right now. It's framing it for us to see where we've been and to notice the problem hasn't gotten better yet. Now, as you look at verses 14 and 15, okay? Verses 14 and 15 provide God's detailed answer to the dispute of his people. He's like, here's how your heart's been calloused. Here's how you have complained against me. Allow me to paraphrase verses 14 and 15. You can follow along in your Bibles there, okay? God basically says this. He says, here's what you said to me. He say, you say, what's the point in serving God? Why bother with obedience to God? Why should we be sorry for our sins? After all, God blesses those who does evil. Uh, it's the proud who seem to get blessed. And the people say, those who dare God to judge them, they're the ones who escape every time. Now notice inherent here, the Israelites, as they look upon the evildoers, as they start to say, those who test God, they escape, they have put themselves in the place of godliness versus those who are ungodly. So in their very accusation, this is very important for self-awareness. Self-awareness will save you a ton of unnecessary pain, heartache, and misery. In their self-awareness, listen to this, they're assuming their own godliness. As they complain to the Lord about other people's evil doing, they're assuming that they are righteous before the Lord. And yet, notice this, their very accusation of God that he is overlooking the sin of evildoers, that's blasphemy in their own right. So the very thing they're saying obviously makes them worse than the people they're accusing to be sinful. The greater sin is their own. And they are questioning and outright accusing God in his character. And isn't that of the state of the heart that has gone south? The state of the heart that has gone south, that gets calloused and hard and moves to complaining. You know what one of the greatest dangers is? Is you can't see your own sin. We fail to see the thing that's most problematic with us, ourselves. But notice what happens. You easily see the sin in others. That's how marriages break down right there. All you do is you see the sin of your spouse, but you fail to see the sin of yourself. That will never, ever work. Friendships are made in humility. 
uh, community in, in the Lord Jesus Christ in this church are made in a, a humility of community and unity even within the diversity in the example again of the Trinity. You see what's happening right there. It's just like I start here, I see what's happening here, and then I begin to understand. If I have a log on my own, I take it out. Then maybe in the place to see the speck in the brother's eye. But the Israelites here, no, 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 they did not see that at all because their hearts were so callous, because they lacked the fear of the Lord, even to the point of accusing God of wrongdoing. Wow. So let's just pull this back to our hub here for a second. Can you see how a loss or a lack of the fear of the Lord leaves you blind. Blind what? Blind to your own sin? Blind to the point that all you are is consumed with self. Be very careful, be very careful. The calloused heart only says, what's in it for me, and how can I improve my situation? And in the very light of losing the fear of the Lord, then we find ourselves focusing on just the self, fear of man, and kind of what's in it for me. And then also, here's what blindness does. It, it, it fails to allow me to truly see the Lord. I can't see God. In fact, to the point you lose the fear of the Lord and you begin to accuse God in a crazy way, accusing him in his character and things that are preposterous in light of his holiness. So the loss of the fear of the Lord leaves the heart calloused, okay? Be very careful. Calloused is what? Losing feeling, losing sensitivity, a grieving the Holy Spirit of God and not really caring about it. This is what's happening right here. We get calloused and it fills us with complaint. The first group of people we see as it relates to those who fear the name of the Lord, the lack of fear leaves us calloused and complaining. That takes us to point number two, okay? Now we see a second group of people. Listen to this point number two. Those who are filled with fear and they are reverent and remember, now remember, when we say fill with fear in this case, this is good. Fill with the fear of the Lord. Those who are filled with the fear of the Lord, they are reverent and they are remembered by God. Look at chapter 3, verse 16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke, this is, this is really beautiful, spoke with one another, and notice what it says next. The Lord paid attention and heard them. Let's stop right there for a second. This reminds me of Proverbs 25, verse 6. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. You see what's happening here? The complainers huddle together and they whine. But notice what the godly do. Notice what the soft hearts do. Those who fear the Lord, they come together and they encourage one another as they speak to one another. And then notice this. I love this so much. We hear the, when we see the heart of God in this text, and the Lord listens in to their conversation. Those who fear the Lord, they get together, they speak to one another, they encourage one another, and all of a sudden the Lord gives his ear and gives his vision to those who are seeking to esteem and honor his name. Now, what a beautiful picture that is. What a beautiful picture that is of God's people and in God's church and how they're supposed to be. Think about this. How do you know you fear the Lord? You gather together, in this case, you gather together, you speak edification to one another in the fear of the Lord, which blesses the relationship you're in and blesses the Lord himself. This is why this gathering is so important. It has to be more than just me uh, preaching to you right now and you listening, as great as that is. It goes beyond that to us interacting with one another, encouraging one another, and the Lord loves the fact when his people gather together, speak with one another, honor him, and fear him. Notice what happens, like what the Lord does in this text. I think it's so amazing. The eyes and the ears of the Lord is automatically drawn to the fragrance of the fear of the Lord. You see it there? Because if you look at verse 16, the Lord paid attention, so his ears, okay, or his eyes, and heard them, his ears. The eyes and the ears of the Lord go towards, it's almost like God smells the fragrance of the fear of the Lord coming up from his people. Here's a question I wonder today. Like, if the Lord is so drawn to the fragrance of the fear of the Lord, what is the fragrance that he is smelling from the church today? 
What is, what, is, what is rising up to him that lands in his nostrils as he pays attention to and draws over to the fear of the Lord? What is, he, what is he seeing? What is he smelling in this case again? And what is he hearing from the church today? Is it the fear of the Lord? What is he, what is he noticing? What, what fragrance is coming up from your life? What fragrance is coming up from your family what fragrance is coming up from the group that you're a part of here in this church? What fragrance is coming up from you and the friends that are here? The Lord is so drawn to those who seek to get together to fear his name. The Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the fountain of life. The Bible tells us the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Bible tells us that the result of the fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. I want you to picture that, the fragrance of the Lord rising to him as we seek to gather in the fear of of his name. But look what happens next in verse 16. This is so awesome. Look at this. And a book of remembrance was written. A book of remembrance was written before him of those, here it is, who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. Now remember, the major complaint of the calloused was, God, you don't see. God, you don't care. God, you don't remember. God, you're prospering those who do evil. And those who test you, they escape. But look what happens here. Verse 17 tells us right here, verse 16 tells us right here, it says this, those who fear him and trust him, not only does he remember, but in fact, he writes it down. A book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. So do you see here what we miss when we focus on ourselves? But when we humble ourselves and fear him, what happens? A reverence fills our lives and remembrance fills God's heart. This is a beautiful, beautiful verse. We gotta remember verse 16. What this tells us is God, God keeps a journal. Do you keep a journal? I keep a journal. Almost always my journal is used to remember the victories, the hope, the faith, the ways that God acted in my life and brought me through trial and crisis, whatever it is. And you write these things down to remember the goodness and the greatness of the Lord. But well, the Lord has a journal too. And in some form, in some way, the Lord is writing down the events and the people of those who fear his name and esteem his name. I mean, how beautiful is that? But it doesn't stop there. Verse 17. They shall be mine, says the Lord. Oh, wow. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. So notice here, the reverent, those who fear the Lord, they are remembered. Notice they are treasured. And what is this other than really, what is this in the gospel? This is the reality for those of us who are alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter 2, 9, I'll read it for you. But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a people for his own possession. You see what's happening there? I mean, there's such a carryover right from Malachi 3, verses 16 and 17 into 1 Peter 2, 9. So notice right here, okay, this is a huge point of maturity here for every Christ follower. Notice what happens with the fear of the Lord as it floods our lives. Notice it's the fear of the Lord that cuts right through the fear of man. Do you see that? The fear of the Lord is what demolishes the obstacle of the fear of man in our lives that holds us back and gets us to focus on that which does not matter. Life in Malachi's day was hard. The opposition was very real. Trials were often but notice here, notice what's happening in the heavenlies. Don't you see what God's saying right here? God's saying, don't you see? In the midst of difficulty, God behind the scenes says, I got you, I treasure you, I've saved you, I love you. Again, let's stop here long enough to understand what's happening. But for you who fear my name, God says, okay, in the midst of the trials, in the midst of the difficulty, God is saying to every person here alive in the Son, Jesus Christ, he says, I see you. I pay attention, he says. I see you. I want you to hear that right now. This is such a wonderful verse of love from God. He sees you where you are right now. He says, I see you. I see it. I see it all. You may not think I see it. You may not feel like I see it. I see you. He says, I pay attention. He says, I hear you. You may not feel like he hears you. You may not see the signs that you want to see to indicate that he hears you. But God says, no, no, I hear you. I heard them. God says this, right? He says, I treasure you. 
I treasure you because you have the righteousness of my son Jesus Christ in you. You are my treasured possession. And God says this. He says, I will save you. I will, I will, future tense, save you. I have saved you. I am saving you, and I will save you. Now, what I want you to see right here, okay, this is, this is the truth and the love of God upon your life right now, okay? God says, I see, I hear, I treasure, I save, I love. All perfectly, okay? Listen, ready, loved ones? Listen, listen. You won't find that anywhere in this world. There's nowhere else you can find that kind of love. Some of you right now, you're trying to search for people who will see you and hear you and pay attention to you and treasure you and love you. And some of you are even trying to find salvation in other human beings. That will never, ever happen. But the Lord looks down upon you right now and he says, he says, listen, I will be your all if you will give your all to me. If you choose to believe in me, you will not find this kind of love anywhere else in this earth. No way, no how. It's not happening. It's only found in the Lord God, God Almighty and his son, Jesus Christ. Be comforted that right now the Lord's reaching out to you and he's saying this again. He's saying how much he loves you and how much he cares for us. But listen, it's still not done. Look at verse 18 now. Verse 18. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. So notice in verse 18, once more, you shall see distinction, okay? So now we see something distinct between the righteous and the wicked, those who fear the Lord, those who do not fear the Lord. So, so much of those who fear his name are what? Are called to look ahead to glory by faith. So loved ones, listen up, listen up, okay, ready? This world isn't it. There's more beyond this world. And this verse right here, notice, verse 18, then once more you shall see. Future tense. See what God's doing again with his people in the old covenant, let alone the new covenant now with us in Jesus Christ? Then once more you shall see, right? So I believe I'm a treasure of the Lord, and one day I'm going to see the distinction between those who love the Lord and those who do not. Those who are for Jesus Christ and those who are against him. Those who are given victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who receive judgment and punishment eternally apart from Jesus Christ. God's like, listen, listen, this world isn't all there is. Live for what will be, right? So what do we do now? Stop letting and allowing our emotions and worth to rise and fall based on whether our boss likes us or not. Right? Stop allowing your emotions and worth to be caught up in this present day. Because in reality, the only identity that truly lasts is the one that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So, of course, the New Testament talks about this. Romans 8, one of my favorite passages. This is about the groaning of glory. Let's take a survey. Who has learned to groan for glory? Anyone? Wow, that's not nearly enough. Really? The rest of you have never learned to groan for glory? I mean, this is, this is what we're called to do. This is what this text says. This is when you see the world and you're longing for your true life and true salvation and true glory and to see the Lord. I don't, I don't believe there's that for you of you that grant for glory. I just, I don't believe it. Thank you. One more over there. One more over there. Right? Look, look, look. Not only the creation, what? The creation groans. Do you know the creation's groaning? Earthquakes? Groaning groaning to be made perfect, new heavens and new earth. These are all signs, right? It's not the way it's supposed to be. But we ourselves are groaning who have the first fruits of the Spirit because the Spirit of God in you is like, this world isn't it. This world isn't it. Live for more. It's coming. It's coming. The Holy Spirit says, live for Jesus. And then and one day he's going to return. The Spirit of God says, don't worship the world. Worship Christ. Grown inwardly as we wait eagerly, okay? So we ourselves grown inwardly and eagerly. And this is, if you're getting a Bible out, this is what you do. You'd be like, this is awesome. That's awesome. Triangle, triangle, right? And be so excited about it. Now notice this. Let's go to the next one here. Push that slide again. I want to see the green. Can the green come out? Got to hit the next slide. Next slide. No, here we go. Okay, watch, watch, okay? Wait eagerly. Here comes the theology. For what? For adoption as sons. You're like, well, I thought I was adopted already. Yes, right? There's the already, but the not yet, okay? So the full adoption as sons is still coming. When we see again in glory and we receive, this is it, the redemption of our bodies. Like, I thought I was redeemed in Jesus Christ. Yes and no, or 
already, not yet. The full redemption of our bodies, right? Who can't wait for that day? Come on now. Who's not groaning for that, right? Come on, right? Amen. 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 You should all be groaning with the fact that you're not getting any younger, all right? Even young people here today, you, your turn's coming, all right? No problem, all right? For in this hope, more theology, we were saved. What hope? That we're groaning that the salvation, all, all this, this hope we were saved for something more, for something better. This is all happening in, in Malachi 3 at the very end. The Lord is saying, listen, man, there's so much to live for. Just before we move on, verse 18, notice distinction between righteous and wicked and notice the distinction between those who serve God and those who do not. Now, why is that important? It pulls us back to verse 14. Remember what the callous people said? The callous people said, it's vain to serve God, okay? That's what the irreverent say. That's what the foolish say. But the reverent irreverent say it's vain. The reverent, those who fear the Lord, say this. It is never vain to live for God. Ever. John Payton said it this way. I love this quote. He said this. He was a fantastic missionary to cannibals. Unbelievable man of God. Those who have tasted the highest joy, the joy of the Lord, will never again ask, is life worth living? Some of you are here right now. You are depressed. You are so miserable. You hate life and you hate self. Your answer is Jesus Christ. The moment you truly taste and see the Lord is good, when it actually happens, at the end of the day, you will never ask again. It doesn't mean life isn't hard sometimes. It doesn't mean we don't have times where we get down. But at the end of the day, you know you were saved for something greater beyond this world. And at the end of the day, in some form, you will never ask again, is life truly worth living? Yes, it is. Because my salvation is not here. It's coming in the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes riding on the clouds. And what a day that will be. A lack of the fear of the Lord is a calloused heart and a complaining heart. Those who are filled with the fear of the Lord are reverent and remembered by God. Awesome. And then number three is this. We see this in our text. A reason now to fear the Lord. Okay. If you notice the two C's and if you notice the two R's. Well, now we get two J's, all right? Here's a reason to fear, judgment and Jesus, okay? This is the reason now to fear the Lord in verses one to three of chapter four, judgment and Jesus, okay? Look at, look at chapter four, verse one. Behold, the day is coming. You say, what day is this? Well, read. Burning like an oven, whoa, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day is coming. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Read that a bit slowly because needless to say, verse one is the judgment part. And that's a pretty serious verse, huh? You just look at it and you study what it's saying right there. You know, right here in verse one, this is a teaching and a doctrine of God's word that many people shy away from. It's a teaching and a judgment that many people pass over or ignore altogether. But let's understand here, okay, the doctrine of the judgment is so critical to the urgency of the gospel. See what's happening right here? Now, God said it, so therefore we don't have a choice. We must preach it. If we're faithful to the Lord, he's smarter than us. He wrote his word. He wants us to know this. And as we read verse one, it should place in us a sense of godly fear. This is not a game. This is not a joke, this life that we're living. This is real. And part of what's real in the gospel and in God's word is judgment is coming. And judgment is serious. Three things I want you to see from verse one on the doctrine of, of judgment. Number one on the screen for you, okay? Number one, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Twice in verse one, behold, the day is coming. Again, it's repeated. The day is coming. The day what? The day, the, the eschatology of the day of the Lord Jesus Christ returning on the white horse and his robe dipped in blood. That's not the, the blood from the cross. That's blood from crushing his enemies, and on his thighs written the name, the word of God. I mean, it's, 
It's incredibly serious, and his wrath is poured out upon all that oppose him. We must understand justice is on its way. The day is coming soon when all wrongs will be righted. The day is coming soon when all arrogant, it says there in verse 1, arrogant and evildoers, they will be judged. That day is coming. Now let's be crystal clear, that will not be a fun day for anyone who is opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. This should cause us to be sober-minded. This should give us reason to fear the Lord. Judgment is coming. In fact, I just want to take a moment to read for you Revelation 19 before. I'll just read it for you. Just, just, like, just, like, just like listen, this, this passage, it, it says, Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called capital F, faithful, and capital T, true, faithful and true. And in, and in righteousness, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and by the name which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You know, some people treat Jesus like he's some kind of fluffy little teddy bear. He came the first time as a humble king really a humble servant and king. He comes the second time as a conquering captain and king of his army and the universe. And it will not be a fun day. Judgment is coming. The second thing we learn from verse one about judgment, this judgment will be severe. It will be severe. Notice what it says in verse one, back in Malachi chapter four. It says, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Wow. It says there, the day is coming that shall set them ablaze. So there's a, an imagery of heat and fire, punishment. Here again is a portion of God's word that those who overemphasize grace and neglect the holiness of God, they don't either understand or appreciate portions like this in God's word. But we learned about, when Pastor Craig taught, we learned about the fire in Malachi 3 is the purifying of God's people, but the fire in Malachi 4 now is the judgment on the wicked. Again, in our day, there's such an emphasis, especially in our day, there's such an emphasis on Jesus and his grace and love. What do I say to that? Love it. Fantastic. Fantastic. The love and grace of Jesus. Absolutely. But what about Jesus being full of grace and truth? John 1.14. That always amazes me. I just, even this week, conversations. And I love the emphasis on people who love and grace and compassion. Yes, yes, of course. But never at the expense of truth. Because the moment you start to leave truth behind, you stop becoming like Jesus. Jesus is full of grace and truth. Truth. You want to hear some truth that Jesus said? These are the parts that are left out, man. The circles that I kind of look into sometimes. Look at this, okay? This is what Jesus said on this subject. He says this. Jesus, quote unquote, the son of man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said this. Next one. Jesus said this, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Then he said this, and if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And what I just do there, I'm just telling you what Jesus said. And those are three examples among many where Jesus loved the people that he spoke to enough, listen, to tell them the truth. 
Jesus desires that none would ever have to go to a place that he just described. But here's what he knows, that if he's rejected, if he's not believed in, if he is dismissed, if he is despised, if he is hated, if he's not received with faith for forgiveness of the people's sins, and there's really only one or two options, one of two options in this life, heaven with Jesus, hell without. And those things just reinforce what's being said in Malachi 4, verse 1. We're learning here in this one verse, judgment is coming, judgment will be severe. And then notice, thirdly we learn about this verse here, is judgment will be final. Judgment will be final. So look at the end of verse 1. It says, um, the day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Okay, It will leave them neither root nor branch branch. Now, as long as there's a root or a branch, there's hope for a return, right? You see a tree that's pruned, even down to a stump, there's still hope, right? And even when the stump is kind of hit at, there's like, if the roots are there, could technically, right? The branches are there, there's hope for the tree, but when the branch is gone, when the root is gone, there's no hope at all. It's over. That tree will never exist again the way it once did. So what are we learning? We're learning this is the reality for all those who oppose and reject Jesus. It gives us reason to fear the Lord. It gives us tremendous reason to fear the Lord. Now remember, why why focus on this right now? Well, again, one, because God does, but two, right? True love doesn't watch someone heading to their death and be like, good luck with that. True love doesn't see someone going over, you know, a falls to their death and sit by and just say they have the ability to throw out a life jacket or something to save them. They don't, love doesn't watch it happen and just say, well, you know, they chose their own path. No, love warns. Love is desperate to save. Love says, listen, you're about to die. The way you're going is not going to end. That's love. In fact, it's a form of hate when a failure to warn people that they're on a path and in reality what they are facing. This is why truth, listen, grace and truth is the love of Jesus. Okay, you know, that's the judgment part. And we always say, though, you can't understand the good news of the gospel until you understand the bad news. And that's the bad news. I told you we're going to start negative, get positive, and now we got negative, but now we end positive. Amen? Amen? Okay, look what God does in his word now. Look at, look at, look at verse 2. There's the word but again. Okay, here comes the contrast. Okay, but, he doesn't just leave us there, right? It's not, not, not left with hope. He says, but for you who fear my name. There we go. There's our title. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness, the son of love, love, hit, love him, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. You shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? So now we come to the hub again of our text. But for you who fear my name, notice what? For you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise. The son, S-U-N, the son of righteousness, I believe wholeheartedly this is reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, will rise with healing in his wings. Awesome. Healing in its wings. Notice the healing from what? Take the gospel. Jesus gives healing from sin and death. Amen. Healing from sin and death. He heals us from this. Notice he brings joy to the point you will go out leaping like calves from the stall. What is that? The joy of salvation. I have seen the Lord Jesus Christ. His sun rays have shone upon me. He has healed me from my wickedness, healed me from my sin, healed me from death, and now I have life. I leap from the stall like a calf who's been set free. Notice also, he treads down the wicked, meaning he secures complete and final victory. This is the reality that in Jesus Christ we cannot lose. We are guaranteed life and victory. But again, notice, notice, notice. But for you who fear my name, for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness brings healing and joy and life. For you who fear my name, oh, who is here today who needs to be filled with the fear of the Lord? And where does that begin? than in the Lord Jesus Christ. I specifically want to encourage, uh, even stronger than that, invite 
Uh, I think even stronger than that, to implore, to plead with people here today to invite you to life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, listen, I beg you to be rescued from the coming judgment. You are here not by accident right now. I implore you to a relationship with Jesus Christ that immediately gives you love and joy that you've never known. I urge you to come to Jesus. I plead with you to turn from sin and trust him as Savior. I ask you, why would you not come today to Jesus? Why would you hesitate? Why would you resist him any longer? The pervasive darkness and gloom of our world, the hurt, the sadness, the sickness, the depression, the misery. But for you today, the sun of righteousness appears, the sun that dispels the darkness, the sun when his warmth falls upon your soul, brings life again, joy and healing and abundance and eternal life, the sun of righteousness rising upon you, I pray even now, the sun that brings this life to all who feel his light, the sun that is felt by the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And consider today, but for you who fear, who fear my name, the Lord says, what? Reverence, remembered, treasured, healing, joy, life, victory. I'm totally dead serious right now, and I don't know who's here. But I beg you, Make day today the day you turn from your sin and run to Jesus Christ. I mean, who here right now? Who here right now? This, this is your moment. This is for you. Jesus is the one who loves you. Jesus is the one who died that you might live. Jesus Christ is the answer, is the answer to this life. You know, you think of the sun itself, the sun that shines upon this earth. The sun a single star gives, gives, gives life to billions on this planet and billions more aspects of creation with ease, with ease. The sun is so powerful, so strong, so much energy left over, but this one sun does all this for this earth. But then there's the sun, the son of God. And with ease, with infinite ease, but not without cost, he gives life to all those who look to him and who desire for his light to shine in the darkness of their life. Jesus, I believe you are real. Jesus, I repent of my sin. Jesus, come, come and make me new. Allow me to come alive that I may never die again. And then what? No fear in death. No fear in death. For this is the power of Christ in me, amen? Right? At that point, all of a sudden, life comes into view, but this only happens in Jesus Christ alone. Oh, Lord, let us be men and women who are filled with fear of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, bring salvation to your house today. I pray even now, Lord, you've already done that. I pray, Lord Jesus Christ, you are reaching and calling out to men and women, maybe young children here right now, who are seeing you as Lord, as Savior. Oh God, may it be so. May we understand, Lord, the seriousness of this life, but may we also understand the joy that is found in you to live, to sing, to celebrate even now the reality. Yeah, yeah, we're groaning, but we're groaning for something that is certain the certainty of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.